We're going to be checking out four surprising ways I become Americanized. Really interested to see what he's got to say. So, yeah, let's jump straight to this and check this out, man. None of them are springing to mind right now. I must have taken on thousands of American English words. I'm sure you fine folks will let me know in the comments below. I like folks. Hat. Hello, I'm Lawrence, and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond, and one of those pertains American to eyes. assimilation. Oh. Assimilating into another's culture. Now, if you are new to my videos, here's a little bit of background about me. I, as you can probably tell, I'm not from the state of Kentucky. Race I actually me. originated from a country known as England. I lived in England for the first 26 years of my life. But in 2008, at the height of the recession, I, along with my wife, made the very bizarre decision to leave London. London for Indiana after eight years hey, living hey. in that nice decision I ain't gonna lie now nah, I've always wanted to move out of England the four countries that I want to move to is uh America Australia Canada Norway boom I would love to live in those countries any one of them very state we moved to Chicago in 2016 prompting the Cubs to win the World Series and in all that time, in those 11 years, it occurred to me just the other day while making a video about five lies that British people in America tell themselves that I had been Americanized. Don't get me wrong, I'm still 99% English. I've got the accent, the passport. and Does that mean that he feels more American than anything else? Is that what that means? So like, he's got the British accent, the British passport, whatever, but, right? But he feels... America. The crap hair. But there are facets of American life that I have acquired into my personality since right. moving here. And I've been thinking very deeply about these for the last four days. And it turns out that that number is appropriate because I can sum up each and every one of these as Lawrence's four C's. That is, every one of them begins with the letter C. And so without further ado, really? here are four big reasons that I've been totally Americanized. Uh, let's see. Coffee. Wait, I'm Americanized already, Dad. I've already had a coffee. I have a coffee every single morning. Maybe even a coffee midday. I love my coffee. And I drink coffee way more than I drink tea. So, yeah, maybe I'm Americanized already. <laughs> I come from a nation of tea lovers, though yeah. I'm not myself an avid tea drinker. As a matter of fact, for the first 31 years of my life, I didn't care for hot beverages at all beyond a simple, you know, hot chocolate, a soothing drink that appears. How? How did you live in England and not have hot drinks? There's three hot drinks you'll have in England. The first one is mainly tea, right? You'd mainly have tea. Now, I prefer coffee to tea, but you would mainly have tea, right? Second one, hot chocolate. Right, love a good hot chocolate, especially in the winter. Third one, coffee. How, how do you, in England as well, when it's always cold, well, not always cold, but like, it, it gets really cold. Field at once to my laid back nature and my admittedly sweet tooth. However, unable to overcome its smell, coffee was the drink that I detested above all others. Somehow its aroma always brought to mind something undrinkable that had festered beneath a stack of inexcusably dirty dishes. Over the what? years, my standard reaction to the question, can I get you a coffee? Had Yo, no wonder you don't like coffee. Why is it so dark? What? Put some milk in it, man. Put some milk. What are you doing? <laughs> the years, my standard reaction to the question, can I get you a coffee, had always been, no thanks, accompanied by a vague feeling of disgust. This feeling wasn't improved either by the false notion that all coffee drinkers were somehow perpetually anxious that the phrase, <laughs> I need a coffee, usually equated to this day cannot get any bloody worse. And, what? you know, I watched my wife with her Starbucks gold membership firmly in hand order drinks whose titles were utterly unfathomable. A grande peppermint iced and spiced no whip mocha latte espresso <laughs> coffee, please. At times I needed a translator <laughs> while she seemed to speak the lingo as if it was her first language. Perhaps it's the American in her. After all, Americans drink one and a half times more coffee than residents of the United Kingdom. Indeed, right. not only do Americans drink more coffee, they eat more coffee too. Occasionally, what? a partaker myself of tiramisu, you could say that it was well you guys are eating like coffee grow yours what are you doing eating coffee huh coffee they eat more coffee too occasionally a partaker myself of tiramisu you could say that it was these food items that laid the foundations for what would later become a life-changing experience but even coffee. after treading the waters after appealing once more to my sweet tooth i still couldn't get past the smell and i was around it now more than ever following a recent career transition that had landed me in an office full 
of writers. Of course, being in such an office was a good thing, right? I mean, on a professional level, it's where I wanted to be. And honestly, I was happy. Why would I want to change that? What were my coffee drinking colleagues getting that I didn't have already? <laughs> the answer was simple, caffeine. I mean, sure, right. you know, I'd been getting this from Dr. Pepper, who, by the way, was not a qualified physician, though most certainly gave me cause to seek one. And so one day, several years ago, I did it. I had my first mug of coffee. Congrats. They say it has an acquired taste on the one hand. It took me 31 years to acquire it. The thing is with coffee, right? It's not just like tea. Like tea, you can have a cup of tea and they, they all kind of taste similar, right? Whereas like coffee, you really need to find your kind of coffee. There's so many different options, so many different choices. You might like, there's coffees that I absolutely hate, but then there's co coffees I don't mind and then coffees I love, right? So you really got to like try and see if you like, just at first go with what you think sounds good, right? So I like caramel. So I would opt for like caramel kind of coffees. Vanilla's nice, I like vanilla. So go with them and then like, just start like expanding a little bit until you find your perfect one. On the other, it came so the moment I finished that first mug. Wow, within an hour, the fatigue had washed away and I felt 18 again. I even put on a t-shirt that said Radiohead. I mean, that didn't fit company dress code, but still. <laughs> now at this point, you may be asking, what does the United States have to do with any of this? Wouldn't you have ended up in a similar scenario had you just stayed in England? Possibly, but there are two things that the United States has in greater abundance in the United Kingdom. Number one, coffee, and number two, the individual desire to succeed. In my right. case, it was a quest to achieve the latter that necessitated the latte. If I was gonna live the American dream, I was gonna have to do it with the following three things as my guide. A keyboard, a camera, and several boxes of Javalia. And while What's we're that? on the subject of success, that brings me on to my next entry. Confidence. From England, I always looked to America as the place that sent men to the moon that pop. See, this is interesting right now because I always think, and a lot of UK people think, that America like portrays themselves to be way more confident than us, right? I just see it. Like whenever I talk to America, they seem more outspoken, more confident what what they say. Then if I talk to like someone from the UK, they're more like, what's the word? They're more like. They're not really outspoken. They're not really that confident. They're, they're more like just keep themselves to themselves. Popularized the computer and that produced my favorite films. I suppose on some level, this instilled in me a vague belief that anything was possible, right? That if you work hard and dare to dream, you can achieve anything. It was a mindset, if not a reality. Right. After years of living in the US, it was that very mindset that would eventually overcome doubt. Growing up in the UK itself, an overachieving island of 63 million people, I was routinely exposed to my country's otherwise apologetic outlook. An outlook wrought with excessive politeness and the phrase it never rains, it pours. In fact, purely by instinct, there were times years ago when I would apologize to somebody because they bumped into me. And I was the kind of person <laughs> that said thanks to cash machines, although that might have just been a Lawrence thing and not so much. Yo, there's no way you said thanks. <laughs> you know what? I actually can see him. I actually can see him at a cash machine, get the money. He's like, oh, thank you, man. <laughs> And I was the kind of person that said thanks to cash machines, although that might have just been a Lawrence thing and not so much a British yeah. thing. I mean, it's not that I didn't have confidence, it was that I didn't know how to use it. Right. Actually, so overwhelmed was I by the sheer size of American life, its cars, its food, itself, that my former doubts stayed with me for a few years after I moved here. In fact, the only way I knew how to react to directives such as, hey, say the word rubbish, was with a sense of self-deprecation. <laughs> but as I continued getting to grips with America's idiosyncrasies and as I threw threw myself into the working environment that was initially customer service, I began to notice a style of interaction so absent from the majority of life back home. Americans were direct, very, very direct. Right. I think I initially mistook this for confrontational rhetoric, right? But I would eventually adopt a similar style myself, learning, for instance, to order a sandwich, thus I'll have a six inch on wheat bread. Before, you know, I'd have peppered my- Wait, no, please. You guys don't use manners over there? I'd be, like, I'd be like, oh, let's have more in a sandwich. I'd be like, oh, can I have the cheese and onion sandwich, please? That, that's how I'd order. I order with softening language, like, would it be possible? Or if you don't mind, that's because... Oh, wait, yeah, we do. Wait, did I just say that? Oh, that means we do. I just said, can I have a cheese and onion sandwich, please? Oh, wait, I always say that. Now, I've just realized. I'm, I'm always, like, asking if I can have it. 
Where is he saying like America's like I'll have a cheese and onions? Like, Yo, what? Now that I think about it, I always say that. Can I have one ticket, please? Or like, am I able to have one ticket? Yeah, wait, yo, that's weird. Yeah, when I pay on card at the shop, can I pay on card, please? Yo, that's mad. Whereas like in America, it'll be like, I'll pay on card. I'll be, I'll be. I'm sure some of you guys use manners, so like, I'll pay on card, please. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, that's weird, actually. Sandwich, thus, I'll have a six inch on wheat bread. Before, you know, I'd have peppered my order with softening language like, would it be possible? Or, mm. if you don't mind, that's because British interactions are built around not burdening the other person. Now, don't worry, I haven't become insufferable or anything like that. There is a, a fine line between efficiently expressing one's feelings and hurting those of other people. Americans, right. like any other people on Earth, sometimes fall either side of this line. But those who get it right, who retain a diplomatic tone while expressing exactly what he or she wants. Yeah, I'm not going to do that in the UK because knowing me, I would go to like a shop or something. I'd be like, yo, get, give me the sandwich now, please. They're gonna be like, what the? F <laughs> what the? F are the very people that I'm talking about. Today, my newfound confidence has led me to places I wouldn't have imagined five years ago, right? So my old self couldn't have conceived he'd have written for BBC America, relocated to Chicago, and convinced 67,000 of you to subscribe to my channel. The truth is, Damn. America has taught me that the more you can directly communicate your wants and your needs, the more frequently these will come to fruition. After all, it never rains, it pours. It does. Close. In Chicago, of course, it doesn't just rain, it bloody snows a lot. And it's probably set to do that here quite soon. We are now in the month of December. The temp We have this jacket in the UK, so I wonder what it means by clothes. We don't have the American hat, obviously. Well, you can get it, but it's not common, obviously. It just, just turned freezing out. I mean, below freezing. This was unheard of for me when I lived in England. Anytime that the temperature approached the freezing point of water, that was mass panic across England. <laughs> Not so much Britain. I mean, the Scots, they could cope. Mind you, a lot of those keep warm because they have one of these on their chin. It's a beard in a lot of cases. <laughs> but the truth is, Britain by no means has to endure weather of that magnitude, which is why I'm dressed like a Chicagoan. When I first moved to America, indeed, the state of Indiana, I saw my whole life flash before me. And then I realized it was just my eyelashes had crystallized. I can't help it, you know, I was forced by necessity to dress like an American, or I should say Americans that live north of the Mason-Dixon, right. you know, with some of their exceptions. It gets cold up here, it gets very snowy, it gets entirely unfit for humans, and so we have to dress like prior humans, Neanderthals, um, in sheepskin. It's not sheepskin, this isn't, it's not real animal, you know, I wouldn't do that. I used to think hoods like this looked silly, right, until I moved to Chicago and... Wait, that's interesting though, because... These kind of coats are popular. Don't know if they are anymore, but you do see them. Like I've had quite a few. My family's had quite a few. So they are popular in the UK, especially in the winter. I had it completely confirmed, um, but I embraced it after a while. At least I embraced what it does for you. This, this warms you up. You need that in this mess out there. Put it this way, in the winter in Chicago, I couldn't get away with wearing a thin Adidas jacket and a Burberry cap. <laughs> You know, I couldn't get away with that in England these days, um, nor could I ever. I was never a chav. Don't get that impression. <laughs> and that's that's the winter for you now. Hey, I had an Adidas uh, jacket, man. What are you trying to say, bro? I couldn't get away with only wearing this. I'd be arrested for one. Um, but uh, also, there are other parts of your body to keep warm. So you sometimes have to wear, you know, multiple layers of, of trousers. And the specific type of right. trousers, you might have a very thick pair of jeans that's very common to the Midwest. In fact, I was once bought as a Christmas present a very oversized pair of baggy jeans. So they were gone by January 1st. <laughs> You know, had to make a fire somehow, so that's that's what it is. Sorry, Grandma. That's, I never told you. Oh, that. poor Granny. And then, of course, there's gloves. You know, you can't get away with just a thin pair of cotton gloves. It has to be the thick, heavy-duty, you know, insulated pair. That's what I have right now. I mean, when I first moved to the US, I just, I, I underestimated it, I suppose. I brought with me this pair of mats. Yeah, to be fair, I think I would as well. So, like, let's say I was moving to America. I think I would underestimate how cold, even how hot it gets as well. I think I, would, I, I reckon I would. At first, I would definitely underestimate how cold it would get and how hot. Manchester United gloves, and they, I mean, they did, they performed worse than the current team. And in the words of George <laughs> Michael, I was almost frostbitten. You know that song? Frostbitten, twice shy. It's once bitten, isn't it? Yeah. 
so that's the winter and of course that speaks to me most obviously right now because it is in fact winter but if you go back a few months to the summer there's another accessory that you might find in my wardrobe uh. don't go in, stay out of my wardrobe it is one of these yes look Baseball isn't cat. this the greatest thing i am so cool i'm so cool but in england we don't have these i mean we do they exist don't get me wrong i remember i had an luminous orange one from lightwater valley when i was nine but never wore one since until i moved to the us and there wait what what is it referring to here is it, it is that a trucker cat where it's like mesh at the back because we we don't really have them is that what he's referred to for a number of reasons for this firstly it keeps the sun out of your eyes Although we're here in Chicago, the, the clouds tend to do that and the high skyscrapers. But uh, so I suppose when it, it comes down to it, I, I wear it really just to look cool. And I do look cool. And anyone who would tell me otherwise is either a liar or my mum. But I don't know why I started wearing this. This one in particular is quite sort of, you know, Americana-y. But I right. just found myself doing it. I mean, I... Does he mean hats in general or does he mean like a type of hat? Is that a trucker hat? I don't know, because he hasn't said. Wait, has he like labeled it? No, just from winter. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm here. I'm wearing a hat right now. I've got a couple of hats over here. The only hat that I don't have is like a trucker hat where it's like mesh at the back. So maybe he's on about that. I think that when you fall into the, the film business and become a filmmaker like me, I mean, I, I make YouTube videos. So that's it's near enough, isn't it? Um, I want it to look more like Steven Spielberg. You've got to feel the part. All I need on here is E.T. And that would make sense because I am an alien, a legal alien, as Sting <laughs> once said. So this isn't New York, is it? And I'm not Sting. But the great thing about these is they're quite versatile, right? You can wear them like this, but you can also wear them like that. Uh, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't do this in public. I, yeah, I mean, I look like a 90s boy band member. Um, don't ask me to sing the Backstreet Boys. But anybody that was listening just then will notice that I said versatile. And it's interesting that, isn't it? Because a lot of Americans will say versatile, which is not something I ever adopted. But that doesn't mean there aren't Americanisms that I didn't. True, true, true. It's true, when you live in another country, you really can't help taking on the vocabulary of that country. Right, of and course. And while none of them are springing to mind right now, I must have taken on thousands of American English words. I'm sure you fine folks will let me know in the comments below. Folks, there's one for you. We don't really use that term back in England, fine folks. And <laughs> Yeah, no, we don't. I never, I never hear that. I've obviously heard of folks, but you never hear of it like in the UK. And I think I started using that as an alternative to guys in the last few months. You know how a lot of young YouTubers start their videos with, hey guys, imagine if they substituted the word guys for folks. It would sound like a 1950s <laughs> infomercial. Well, if I'm not careful, I'll start talking like Jimmy Stewart. Oh, Mary, if George Bailey ever dressed like this, Clarence would lose his absolute stuff. So yes, I realized in this video that the word folks is most certainly an example. Right. Why not look to other videos for more? And the first one, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess it's I guess. I know, right? I guess. Um, which is another one. Is another one I've really picked up. Uh, the word trash is prevalent. In fact, whenever you try to say uh, rubbish uh, to somebody, um, they oh, think you that's trash. Uh, speaking a foreign language most of the time, I think. Because my first job in the United States was working um, for a cell phone company. Oh, yeah, we say mobile, not cell phone. And so I could hardly be saying, um, hey, how can I, can I help you out today with your mobile phone? Uh, the word sidewalk. This yeah, one came path. up the other day, right? I did a video all about my new apartment, but it has slipped in. I do refer to it as the fall, and there's just nothing I can do about that now. I'm not wearing any trousers as I record this video, um, but you'll notice there, I refer to them as trousers merely to make the point that I've stopped doing that in my everyday life. Oh, really? I now refer to them as pants without thinking about it. When I heard that they were called egg- Yo, pants is the, in the UK is literally out underwear, so that's so... <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I... It would be weird get used to that plant i feared the worst i imagined it was going to be some kind of odd mutation between vegetation and yolk i said vacation and i'm always saying that and i think it's because vacation. you find people there was no operable light as you walked in the door uh, so we've taken to hang in one of these this is a, a flashlight i was just trying to scare you all well that confirms it i'm multilingual <laughs> that's it for this episode let me know in the comments below if enjoyed that one hopefully you guys enjoyed it as well let me know what you guys think in the comment section if you guys did enjoy make sure you thumbs up subscribe for more content i'm live every single day on twitch.tv forward slash l3wg if you guys want to check me out over there i'll see you all in the next one peace